We're in Venice with David. We said How do we pronounce your name? Well, it's changed. Catan? It was. Catan? It was according to my parents. It was Catan, yeah. and then coming to Italy, when the kids were born, and we took them to England. The younger one, at seven years old, went to Watford Football Club for the summer season. What's that, Caton? Is it Caton? Bravo! Exactly that. <laughs> Out came the big burly coach guy, and he went sort of Smith, uh, Caton, Caton, and he didn't move. So yeah, I elbowed yeah, him. Yeah. I said, "That's you." And he Good. came back home and said, "Why didn't you tell me my name was Caton?" <laughs> so it's now become Caton Catan. Where are you from, Dale? From yeah. well, born in somewhere north of London. Yeah, so okay. I'm told. Good. Uh, but moved quickly to middle London, then up north, then back down south. So England, England, England. England, basically. England till the age of eighteen. And then what happened? Oh, then there was university. Bradford oh. is England, isn't it? Yes, oh, I still so. I believe so. Bradford. Yes, yeah, okay. but then America. That was oh, really? where the change was made. I thought yes. you just went straight to Italy. No. Tell me about America. No, the whole thing well, was. Well, wait, wait, what's your job? Just so people know what do I do? why we're talking. Okay. Um, Full professor in translation yeah. at the University of Salento, Lecce, yeah. Italy. In Italy, the south of Italy. About Good. 400 kilometers south of here. That's where we have, we're in Venice. Yes. So that's where we have to get to. So what were you doing in the States? Um, I was working as a um, volunteer. I was interested in social work. That's where I was going. And it was part of Michigan University. And I was working in a school for man mentally handicapped kids. Yeah. And severely handicapped and yeah. um, we were teaching them after months to tie their shoelaces and uh, to walk and to you know, motor skills and you were into that you were a man of yes. patience and commitment are you? Uh, very much anything that was uh, it was a volunteer scheme it was a summer it was four months five months um, and there were a variety of options and I actually wanted New York uh, to work with in drug rehabilitation uh, but ended up in Kalamazoo. <laughs> Nobody knows where that is. Yeah, Michigan. And there it was uh, that I was working in, as I said, in this school and had no interest in languages at all, uh, but in people and was thinking of anthropology, social anthropology or social work. That's what I was thinking of. This is what the age of what, 23, 24. So, how did we get you into translation? Um, there was an Italian girl. Oh, that's obviously. Yeah. And she said, come to my house in Italy. Mm. And I thought, well, why not for the holiday, Christmas season? And so I went over. And what was really interesting was that I was convinced that she lived in a house, a villa, which I thought must be in Tuscany. And I presumed it was summer in Italy all year long. And it was full of uh, old ladies in black on mules and... Mm. Uh, you know, the um, Godfather, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. And ended up in northern Italy on the Austrian border. And the people were tall, blonde, blue eyed. And uh, I was on the fifth floor of an apartment block. And I suddenly realized this power of language and the way you could interpret things. So the house was actually an apartment. That's what gets okay. Don't worry about oh, it. Oh, it does. Okay. So the house was actually an apartment. And Italy was raining and it's cold <laughs> and it was full of people who didn't look Italian. And then I started learning Italian because I thought, well, I'll be here for a while, just for a short while and do some teaching. And as I learned Italian, I began to realize how different things were. And one of the things that just struck me as being amazing was when you're ordering a coffee, instead of saying, excuse me, I'd like a, you can just say, un café, yeah. with a fairly <laughs> unpolite voice. And you go in for your groceries and you want to say, have you got any? All you need to say is, ah. And I was absolutely shocked that mm. things could be so different. It's not the politeness conventions of English. And my girlfriend started saying, tell me, tell me, mm. tell me, mm. yeah, and pass me. Mm. And I was getting irritated with these imperatives. So I just began to catch translation at the raw end, at the... At the at the end of somebody who actually has to understand what it is that's going on. Mm. And then at university, I was just lonely paid language assistant. So you stayed then? It wasn't stayed just a fling. Come visit me. It was more than that. Well, it turned into more than that because I was offered a job at university 
as, and again, it was a, it was a translation problem, as a lecturer. And I was going, it's not where I'm, I'm not, I haven't got any qualifications. But it turned out the job was a lettore, mm. which is actually a language assistant, yes. mother tongue teacher. So that, I thought, well, I can do mother tongue. And doing that, wandering around the library, I discovered there was a book by Newmark that showed that there were rules about translation, or at least he wrote rules. And I got really, really interested in this and started translating, learning Italian, making horrible mistakes, and then ended up very quickly at the School Interpreti in Trieste. And then quite suddenly found myself just taken into the world of translation, interpreting, language difference, but from the point of view of a non-linguist, because I'd not grown up yeah. with a linguistic But you're, we should tell all our viewers here that you're, you're Mr. Cultural Aspect of Translation. Yeah. Oh, You've made a name of yourself in, in the cultural aspect of the translation, the non-linguistic part of translation, or is that unfair? No, that's exactly the case. And so I, how did you get to that? Well, it wasn't very difficult because I hadn't got linguistic training. It was much easier ah, for me. Helps. Yes. Much easier <laughs> for me to look at the reality of what goes on in translation. Yeah. And so I saw the communicative aspect, and I'd grown up with communicative teaching and had studied aspects of anthropology at university. Okay. And so I was really interested in social anthropology and from there I've not really moved very far yeah. because that's I but guess in your book Translating Cultures. Is that a direct product of, of, of that moment? The tell me, give me yeah. a certain sense. But I, the, the so social anthropology yes. background. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Right. And it's it's just looking at human communication and focusing more on the language and translation as a result of looking at the mm. social and cultural aspects. Did you do that book when you were in Trieste? Yes, yes, it was okay. in Trieste, yes. Right. And it was part Which of is a very prestigious translation school, yes. especially for training interpreters as well. Oh yes, and it was the number one in Italy and maybe the number two, number three in Europe, I'd guess. Yeah, and it was, for, especially for interpreters. Yes, I and mean, it was the place. Yeah, yeah. And that's certainly where I sort of honed my skills and learned, learned by doing, learned on the job. Yeah. But I also did a short course, which was extraordinarily useful. Um, the neurolinguistic program, which has not been very uh, well received, but it was based on guest out uh, psychology, and that basic understanding took me to people like Bateson and um, other social anthropologists, into culturalists, and then got into business training, where we only looked at uh, intercultural differences. So I just learned a lot from the business point of view of what the business world were getting into in terms of cultural communication where companies were getting together and um, you've got sort of global teams working mm. and it was the beginning of sort of virtual communication across yeah. cultures and the beginnings of the using sort of social media. Did you do, ever do any of those courses yourself as in yeah. training? Oh yeah, that was, I, I was the you, trainer. You were the trainer. I yeah. was the trainer, yeah. so I had about... I was doing, yes, I had already been doing about 10 years of that training. Okay. And then the idea of the book came about thinking, well, there's this training where I've got the practical experience. The language is coming through and the translation that I'd been reading just didn't seem to touch that. Newark has two or three pages yeah. of cultural words. So you weren't very happy with translation studies as you found it then? No. I should imagine. Are you happier with it now? Oh, that's a good question. Do you think we have caught up to you or learned from you? <laughs> no, I think, no, I think the opposite. I think things have now moved much further than I'd imagined. Mm. And I'm catching up, I think, now. Ah. Or at least I'm now feeling that there's a large number of us on the same, on the same road going in the same direction. There isn't the fight that there was 20-odd years yes, ago to say, you know, uh, intervention. I mean, now it's, yeah, there is intervention, what do we do about it, how yeah. do we... What's good intervention? Yes, exactly. What, how do we... You're looking at the third edition of that book now, Translating Cultures. Yes. So do you find you have to change a lot, or 
Or is, um, it, is it as true then as it is now? Well, the basis is absolutely what it was. Then it was pushing to say, look, this is actually what's going on and translators should know about it. So it's still useful as a primer to those who don't know about it, but clearly most of the academic community do. So it's useful still as a basis as a primer. What simply needs to be done is to add a lot more on the fact that there's a digital communication yeah. which is changing a lot, not everything. What year was that published? Well, the first the very yeah. first issue was 1996 that was very much a home family and friends then 1999 and then 2004 so it's 2004 is still a long time okay. ago yeah, yeah. and it's 15 years ago this was with St Jerome yeah that's then bought by Ralph so there's a 2014 yeah, 14 on the cover yeah, but it right. goes back to yeah. 2003 in terms of the material that's in there okay. What kind of, no, we, we missed out the move from Trieste to where you are now. Oh, right. All right. Well, that was, was simple. Okay. <laughs> that was very simple. But did that give you, I guess, the power to set up something new, something that you, mm, let's you just, came in as a full professor? I came in as a full uh, professor, but uh, that was the moment that the taps were turned off in Italy in terms of new funding okay. in terms of funding okay. so as I arrived uh, things just became extremely difficult and uh, there was talk basically of where do we cut mm. how do we cut so this uh, is post 2008 yes yeah, so yeah. I arrived 2006 okay and really the last year of everything's possible here because mm. Tris was already cutting um, and by the time I'd sort of begun to feel my feet, um, it was too late. Um, and also being an outsider has its downside, because not being politically very savvy and not really knowing the ways things work. In the Italian place. university system. Yes, I mean, I'd written about it, that? and I know a lot about it in theory, but I can't <laughs> well, do it. Yes, okay. So I'm pretty good at seeing it, understanding it, not so good at actually uh, manipulating it myself. Okay. I mean, it requires a huge amount of time and effort. Um, Over these years, though, you set up and you're still editing uh, a journal, yes. Cultus. Can That's you tell us a bit about that or what, what its aims are? <coughs> um, at the time, so go back to 2006, yes, uh, that's when we started thinking about it. There didn't seem to be a journal that reflected constantly my interests, which were translation and the intercultural side. And the sort of multicultural dimensions of communication, originally in business, because that's where I'd started off the interest, but then that's um, now very much on the sideline. So really it was a journal that I thought people who were interested and were following the same sorts of people that I were following, so ethnomethodologists, social mm -hmm. anthropologists, who were talking about translation or translation people who were bringing in into cultural aspects. At the time there didn't seem to be a journal, and I don't think there was. Uh, I mean today there are quite a few, but there are certainly a large number that have intercultural as part intercultural of Intercultural studies, we take yeah, that on to get away from linguistics. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's going well, or is it a... I think it's going very well. Yeah. Um, How many years has it been now? Um, 12 now, yes. That's a lot of work. Yes, it'll be 13 this year. A lot of work. Yes, yeah, so it's th what, one a year. We were originally going to do two a year, and it was just, frankly, too much work. Um, and so we kept the number of entries fairly small, but all of them have always been with that ambit. and. Um, no, it's been, and it's also been a nice mixture with an interview and, and papers. Sure. And we'll have the same this year. Sure. What kind of research do you think we need in translation studies? What kind of research do we need in translation studies? If well, you were a young doctoral student fishing around for a topic. Well, I would still continue, and I don't think enough has been done on intercultural communication in translation, the way 
I understand it, which is looking at uh, cultural drives and cultural orientations. The word culture, the way I understand it, has been rubbished as being essentialist, mm. which is understandable and is not wrong in the sense that, yes, it is reductive, but I think that putting things in boxes is quite useful for learning. Then you can take things out of boxes. Are you talking about all Italians do this? Yeah, Germans exactly. Do that? All right, yes. okay. I'm sure there are some Italians who don't, but yes. It's, it's exactly that sort of criticism, which is absolutely right, but you don't want to throw out the baby with mm -hmm. sure. the rest of the bathwater. So, um, I think a lot more needs to be done, really, in looking at the profession itself, because what's happening is we're doing a huge amount, I think, in bringing in lots of other disciplines and making translation a lot more of an interesting subject mm. and not just the linguistic exactitude yeah. exercise that it had been. And I don't think there's any problem there. It's going mm. probably in too many directions, but that's fine. Mm. It's going everywhere. Yeah. It, it's, it's exploding. You didn't but mention the, the, the um, surveys you did. Surveys, but, but you've held up a mirror to the profession. Yes. As, as well as a survey can, because you have lots of Lots of responses. Yes, I mean, the first one was a thousand and something, yeah. the second one was 800. And there, to a certain extent, though, it skewed in the sense I got what I got. Yeah. So yeah. I just sent an email Stop out and, and yeah. it got a thousand responses. And clearly, that doesn't represent everybody. And it was clearly those who had some connection with me, in a sense, mm. because it started from me. It went to various associations, yeah. but 25% were had some Italian connection. And yeah, sure. 15, 20 still, it's, British it's connection. knowledge, it's more knowledge than yeah. we had before. Always. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, what it did show, which did surprise me, was how satisfied translators were. Mm. And how, in the second survey also, how much money they were actually earning, which was surprising because most... Uh, complain, understandably, that it's underpaid. But then when they were actually asked, you know, how much do you actually earn compared to the national average, and it's basically mm. the various national averages, the results were surprisingly positive. And there was, you know, a 15, 20% who were earning twice as much as the national average, and a 5, 7% who were earning up to five times the national mm. average. Yeah, there are niche markets there. And most were earning the national average, up, and most were on the up. Mm. And so basically, over the years, clearly, things were improving. And, and that, was, that was something that surprised me, because you got the comments, which were, it's a rubbish profession in terms of pay. Yeah. But then you looked at the statistics, the actual okay. quantity, they're actually, you know, individually, they're doing well. I mean, I suppose it's like uh, musicians or actors. The you know a lot are unemployed, a lot mm. are out of work and doing bar work. But the ones that are working professionally, who are working full time, are doing very very mm. well. Thank you. And the future also asking about the future. There was there were as many positive replies as negative. And it was actually. Um, the question was in response to a Le Monde article, which is the year 2025, translation won't exist mm -hmm. as a human profession. There were over 50% who said that's not true, and 49% who said yeah, that may well be true. Mm. But there was you know, a healthy 50%. Yeah, yeah the discourse of complaint is not wholly founded. Absolutely, yes. And the official numbers show that the labour market is growing. Absolutely, a lot. Yeah. So, so the more machines work, the more humans are doing. And I, I get the feeling. Oh, and, and, and the more the international thing. English, the more translation. It, it's yes. These are not mutually exclusive. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And the more is being paid to to the top end. And I think you've said exactly the same thing. It's and it seems to be absolutely the case. I mean, the future is very very bright for those who are qualified, those who are professionalised, uh, those who do a good job. Uh, and there is a, an unofficial filter. Yeah. On that optimistic note. Right. Thank okay. you very much, Dave. Thank you. Thank you.